And thank you to X2 for having me and everyone who is watching now and later on for joining us tonight. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different behaviors that you all may have seen in your caregiving experience, about finding the why behind those behaviors and how to address a couple specific behaviors uh, we'll talk about strategies to maintain the independence of care receivers and, of course, cover some ways to manage caregiver stress and distress. Um, so we'll first talk about finding the why behind behaviors. Um, it's important to remember that every behavior has a purpose, and sometimes we have to do a little bit of work to find out why that is. Um, most often, it is a form of communication. So dementia causes actual physical changes to the brain and affects not just memory, but also other areas of thinking and cognition, including the ability to plan ahead, to follow a plan, the ability to pay attention, and the ability to communicate. Um, so that can present in a number of ways, but includes difficulty finding words, difficulty understanding what others are telling us, and difficulty expressing emotions appropriately. So because people living with dementia experience changes in their ability to communicate verbally, they often communicate through other means, including behavior. Instead of being able to say something like, you know, I really wanted spaghetti for dinner, but we're having chicken again, it might kind of show up as them just pushing the plate away or pushing the plate off the table. Um, any kind of agitation or behavior because they're not able to express it verbally. It also means that caregivers need to adjust the way that we communicate with them by doing things like including more visual cues and gestures and speaking in ways that are a little bit easier to understand. Um, so again, behavior is used as a form of communication. Every behavior has a meaning, just like if you or I were to engage in any, any type of behavior, and it's used to communicate desires, needs, and concerns, uh, and to be able to understand what the behaviors mean, we have to think about what factors might be influencing them. Uh, it takes a little bit of detective work on the part of the caregiver to determine that. Uh, so I'm going to specifically go through a few behaviors that you may have experienced as caregivers, but I want to first talk about a three-step approach that can be helpful to keep in mind when dealing with any types of behaviors, even if they're not ones that I cover tonight. Uh, and I also want to say that you know your care receiver best, and you know that some of these tactics, these strategies may work well, and some may not be a great fit for you and your care receiver. And some may work one day and then not the next. So there's just a couple of things to give a try and a few things to think about. Um, so this three-step approach is to first specifically name the behavior. So instead of just putting it off as, oh, you know, she's agitated, she's irritated, look at what she's doing and say, you know, mom gets upset when I tell her that it's time to shower and she starts, she goes to the other room and tries to get away from the bathroom. So next, identify the cause. Think about some of the factors that might be involved. Think, you know, what would make me do that behavior? And then finally, once we know the cause, we're better equipped to respond appropriately and address the root of the issue. Something else to consider is that it's sometimes better to accommodate the behavior when we can rather than to fight it. I had one caregiver call me several years ago. Uh, her husband kept going into their home office and shuffling the papers around, getting them all out of order and losing some papers, misplacing them. And she's tried at that point when she had called me, she tried locking the office so he couldn't get into it or locking all of the papers away. He would get upset and then have an argument. He would ask where the papers are. So I asked her and I said, you know, what did he do? when he was working, well, he was a business owner. So he was probably pretty used to dealing with papers and filing things. So what we ended up trying to do to accommodate his behavior was putting away the important papers and maybe putting copies or different papers on top of the desk so that he could still go in and fulfill that need to move the papers around and feel like he was 
doing something helpful um, without getting any papers misplaced. So sometimes the answer is to accommodate the behavior when possible. All right, so some contributing factors to consider. Um, you want to think about different things that, again, would cause you to engage in that behavior. Um, it can be really helpful to keep a diary and write things down. It might reveal some patterns in your care receiver's behavior and help you figure out what the trigger might be. So looking at the time of day, for instance, if you have a care receiver who is trying to leave the house at the same time every day at 3 p.m., maybe the trigger is the time and it might be because they picked up their children every day at that time and they're following the habit that they did for many years of their lives. Um, next, looking at the environment. So do they tend to get upset in the same setting or around the same people? The level of stimulation, and that can be either when someone is overwhelmed or if they're bored, um, either can cause some different behaviors that you might see in dementia. Considering whether they might be in pain or uncomfortable, so maybe they're just not feeling well but can't put those feelings into words. Uh, sensory deficits, so is it possible that their vision or hearing has declined and they are reacting to that in some way? Uh, personal strengths and interests. So do they have opportunities to engage in things that they're enjoying, that they're able to do? And then finally, looking at internal and external triggers. So is there something that's prompting this behavior that they're seeing or hearing or experiencing? Or is it something that might be more internal, like hunger or, again, pain or other feelings? So looking at a few specific behaviors, uh, we'll start with managing medications. Some of the common challenges that caregivers call me with with medications is refusing to take medications that their caregiver is trying to give them or skipping doses or even duplicating doses. So taking their medication more often than they need to. So after we've identified the specific behavior, we can kind of think about some different causes. So one of the causes might be forgetfulness. So they might think, you know, did I already take this? And either taking it a second time or a third time or not taking it at all. Confusion with time is also a symptom of dementia. And someone who is living with dementia may feel like they took their medication more recently than they really did. Or they may feel like it was longer ago than it actually was because of their difficulty to judge time. Uh, if your care receiver is spitting out their pills or kind of pushing it around in their mouth, it might be because they have difficulty swallowing. So that's something to consider. Um, lack of awareness is also often a symptom of dementia, uh, lack of awareness of their own symptoms. If they don't believe that they need to take the medication, they may be resistant to it. One that we see often or hear often is people that care for their care receiver that lives in a different home than them and they'll visit and there's far more medication in the bottle than should be at that point. Um, and it may be because they're having a hard time opening their pill bottles at home. They're not able to open it on their own so they can't take the medication. And finally, distrust. So paranoia can be a symptom of dementia, that suspicion. And if it was myself and someone were to hand me a medication and tell me I need to take it, but I didn't know what it was for, you know, I think most of us would probably say no. Um, and that sense is only heightened in someone living with dementia who's experiencing that paranoia or distrust. Uh, so now that we've looked at some of the causes, some strategies to try using a pill organizer that has each day marked and even pairing that with a whiteboard that says, you know, today is Wednesday. Um, you could add some check boxes if you have AM and PM meds. A caregiver sets it up each week and the care receiver is able to either take it on their own or the caregiver can do a little bit of prompting. Um, developing a routine, so maybe pairing medications with things that they already do at similar times each day. Um, there is some evidence that people living with dementia can form new habits. So if your care receiver gets up every morning 
and goes straight to that coffee pot to drink some coffee, maybe pairing those morning medications with that coffee or with the first thing they're doing when they wake up. Um, if it is truly unsafe and your care receiver is duplicating doses, it may come to a point where you need to secure the medications for their own safety. Some medications can be very dangerous if they're taken too often or too much. Um, so it is important to keep safety in mind. Uh, and sometimes if you're getting the paranoia from the person, it may be helpful to get a note from their doctor. So asking their doctor to write a note that says, Miss Jones, um, you know, please take this medication twice a day you know, with meals and then sign it from the doctor. Uh, it can be really helpful to have a second voice telling them to do that. And then also to hear it from someone else that's not their caregiver. And finally, if swallowing is an issue, uh, ask your doctor about alternative forms. Some medications may come in patch form or in a liquid form that might be a little bit easier to manage than a pill. All right, um, so next, eating. Some common challenges that I hear about is refusal to eat at all, maybe eating too much, eating all day, being really messy or having improper table manners um, while eating, so maybe eating with their hands, nutritional deficiencies. So I have some patients who will only eat candy and that's all their caregiver says they'll eat, and then problems dining out. So some causes to consider uh, might be medication side effects. So some medications can affect our care receiver's ability to be hungry. Um, diminished senses. So I don't know about you all, but I know when I smell dinner cooking in the other room, I start to feel a little bit more hungry and start to, you know, want to move towards eating dinner. But if the care, if your care receiver can't really smell as well, they may not be getting those cues. Um, decreased coordination may be an issue. So the person may have a hard time cutting their food, picking up a fork, even things like peeling fruit may be very difficult. Uh, they may be having oral or stomach pain. So due to dentures or due to a sore in their mouth, it just makes it really hard and painful for them to chew. They may have a decreased appetite due to their age or again, due to medications. Uh, sometimes people living with later stage dementia may have a hard time recognizing food or what exactly they need to do with it, especially if it's a newer food, not one that they're very familiar with. And then finally, another cause might be that they're just a little bit overstimulated. So if you brought them the dinner while they're sitting on the couch watching TV, or if they're at the table and there's a lot of other stuff on the table, they may have a really hard time switching their focus from, you know, watching TV mode to eating mode. So some strategies to try. Uh, setting a routine can be really helpful. So you, eating at a similar time each day, um, you can even kind of get them into the mode of helping you prepare the food or setting the table. So doing things that they are able to do may kind of prime them for this is meal time. You know, I'm gonna set the table and we're gonna sit down and eat. Try to minimize distractions. So eating at the table rather than in front of the TV. Um, doing what you can to simplify the environment. So again, eating at the table, just keeping the necessary items there, not a whole lot of um, extra decorations or anything around. Uh, dine together. So this works in a couple ways. One, you're able to model what they're supposed to do so they can kind of look to you for some cues of, you know, okay, we're going to, I can just pick up the sandwich and eat it with my hands or, oh, like I need to scoop this soup with a spoon. And it's also just a little bit nicer to be able to eat with someone rather than dining alone while they're off in the other room doing something else. Um, offering snacks throughout the day that they can eat can be helpful. It might work that they're able to eat several snacks throughout the day rather than three large meals. Um, so again, I spoke about accommodating the behavior. So if the person is unable to manage a fork and a knife, um, 
maybe providing foods that are able to be eaten with their hands. So um, chicken tenders, peeled fruit, things that they don't have to do much with and can just pick up and eat with their hands. There's also some research that shows that high contrast dishware, so red dishes, red plates, can be really helpful uh, in getting someone who's living with dementia to eat a little bit more because they're able to differentiate the food on the plate much better. It can also be helpful just to not crowd the plate so that they can really tell what they have in front of them. And then finally, allow extra time. So if you're rushing to get to an appointment and you're trying to get your care receiver to eat a meal really quickly before this appointment, it can turn into a really stressful situation for both of you. All right. So next is getting dressed. So some common challenges I hear about with this is getting resistance to getting dressed. Um, or one I've heard a lot is, you know, I'll tell mom that she needs to go into her room and get ready and get dressed. And 20 minutes later, I go in and she's just sitting on her bed or she's just standing in front of her closet and she hasn't gotten dressed at all. Care receivers might choose inappropriate choices, either for the weather or for the occasion for where you're going. Uh, they may have a somewhat disheveled appearance, so maybe their buttons aren't quite lined up or buttoned correctly. Uh, might be mismatched outfits, so clothes that don't quite go together. Or you may experience them disrobing, so taking their clothes off in inappropriate places. All right, so thinking about some causes for that, especially the resistance or the, you know, taking a very long time to get dressed, it might be overwhelming. So they're looking at a huge closet full of a ton of different options and not really knowing what to wear, having to think about, you know, where are we going? What's the weather like? Who's going to be there? You know, what can I wear? Which of these clothes fit? Which ones can I, can I button and get on? Um, it might be confusion. So again, getting ready to go somewhere is really a process. And for a lot of us, it's automatic, but it does need to be done in a certain order. So you can't put on your socks and then your shoes and then put on your pants. Um, you have to do that in that certain order. And that can be a little bit overwhelming and confusing for someone living with dementia. Might be discomfort, uh, might explain either the disrobing or the resistance to getting dressed. So clothes might be too tight or too itchy or too hot. Um, and that's when you may kind of see them taking their clothes off in an inappropriate place. Uh, modesty may be a concern. So this, if this is someone who's been independent for most of their life and now all of a sudden they're expected to be okay with getting changed in front of their adult child or a paid care caregiver who might be a stranger, uh, it's going to be a little bit embarrassing for them. They might be resistant to doing that. Uh, you may also see decreased coordination having an effect. So someone might have difficulty threading a belt through the belt loops or have a hard time buttoning really small buttons. And then finally, um, a lack of interest, which is a symptom of dementia. So they just may not feel up to going to church or dinner or an appointment or up to leaving the house. So now that we've thought about some causes, some strategies to try, uh, first simplify their wardrobe. So put away clothes that they either don't wear at all or clothes that aren't appropriate for the current season. Um, and then maybe put away or donate some of the clothes that are harder to get into and out of. So clothes that are really easy to pull up over their heads or pants with waistbands. Um, this can be especially helpful if they have to use the restroom. If incontinence is an issue, they need to be able to quickly use the restroom. You can provide a few options. So pick out a couple appropriate outfits for the weather and the occasion. And that allows for a good balance between giving them independence and autonomy, but also reducing overwhelm. So they're not looking at this whole huge closet full of outfit options. Um, they just have a couple different outfits to pick from, and it's a little less overwhelming. Also consider the comfort. So are they going to be comfortable in the clothes that they're wearing? 
uh, use a lot of communication. So if this person needs a lot of assistance with getting dressed, rather than just dressing themselves, them yourself without saying anything, kind of walk them through it. So, okay, dad, we're going to go to church now. So would you rather wear this shirt or this one? Okay. I'm going to have you put up your arms and communicate and walk them through it rather than just kind of moving them yourself and dressing them yourself. Um, again, allow a little bit of extra time in your schedule. So if your appointment is at two and you have to leave your house by 1.30, 1.15 is probably not the best time to start getting ready. Start a little bit earlier so that you have that, that padding into your schedule. And finally, be flexible. So if their clothes are maybe not super well matched, but it's what keeps them happy and gets them out of the house, it might not be worth the argument to try and get them to change. All right. So um, now we'll talk a little bit about encouraging independence through dementia. Um, maintaining independence can help maintain the dignity of your care receiver and then also preserve their activities of daily living skills like bathing, eating, and mobility, and then also helps maintain a sense of pride in the person um, rather than having everything done for them. They know that they're doing what they can do to to care for themselves. All right, so a few ways to encourage independence is to establish a routine. So keep some consistency in day-to-day -day life. Um, they know what to expect and they're not getting curveballs thrown at them. They can settle into a routine. Use written cues. So you can use a whiteboard or a large calendar and write down daily activities, things that are coming up and that way when they ask, you know, what are we doing today or um, when is my appointment, you can say something like, well, let's go check the calendar together and go look together and say, oh, look, it looks like your doctor's appointment is next Wednesday at one. So rather than just telling them that and then they would probably keep asking if you're walking over the calendar with them and showing them, they can start to form that habit of looking there first rather than asking you as the caregiver. Um, next, request household help. So everyone wants a purpose in life, and um, there's several ways you can do this. So it might be, you know, mom, I've got so much laundry right now. Can you fold my towels for me? Or can you set the table? Uh, things like, you know, mom, my bookcase is um, very disorganized. Can you sort my bookcase for me? And if they don't do it exactly how you would do it or exactly how you think it should be done, you know, that's okay. Uh, they have a purpose. They're using their, you know, their hands are moving around um, and you've given them something to do. Uh, next, focus on their abilities. Think about what they can do rather than what they can't do. Uh, for instance, if they enjoy gardening, they may not be able to maintain an entire garden like they used to do, but maybe they could help with a hose or with a watering can kind of small things uh, that they're able to do to do things that they enjoy and engage in meaningful activity. So rather than just spending all day watching TV, doing things that keeps them busy, things that are meaningful. So that might be arts and crafts, looking through photos, any kind of movement, so socialization if you're able to. And finally, modify the environment. So you can do things like add shower bars or other changes that can help maintain their independence instead of having to be reliant on others. Okay, and finally, uh, we'll talk about reducing caregiver distress, which is very important. Um, some things to keep in mind is first, pick your battles. So think about whether something is really worth having an argument over. Uh, you're likely not going to win an argument with a person living with dementia. And if it's not a safety issue or a health issue, sometimes it's okay to just kind of let things go. Next is to be flexible. So if you have the best day ever planned or a really great day planned, a uh, fabulous dinner cooked, you know, your care receiver may still just want to stay home all day or have a peanut butter and jelly for dinner, and that's okay. Um, which is also why it can be really helpful to try and keep it simple. So try not to overcomplicate things for yourself as much as possible. 
And next is to ask for help. So, you know, maybe you have a brother who isn't great at the day to day care of your mom like you are, but I bet he could mow the lawn for you or could take her for a walk or out to lunch so that you can get a little bit of a break. So ask specifically for different types of help, whether that's from your family or from a paid, paid caregiver, your care receivers, friends, and it doesn't necessarily have to be some big thing. It can just be something kind of small that you know they're able to do to give yourself a load off of your shoulders. Seek support, so through organizations like ACTS2, through a therapist or possibly a church, or through other organizations that are local to you. I know in Tallahassee, we have some really great resources, and I know they have them throughout the state as well. Um, every county in the state is also served by a memory disorder clinic. So that's where I come from, is the Tallahassee Memorial Memory Disorder Clinic. We have a 10 county service area, but every uh, county in Florida has an MDC that is there for referral to resources, evaluation, diagnosis, emotional support, education, all different types of things. And then finally, step away. So sometimes you just need to take a break. Um, if your care receiver is not doing something that puts themselves at risk, but is maybe doing something like asking you the same question over and over, or engaging in a repetitive behavior, you know, maybe they're maybe they have a pen and they're tapping on the table and the tapping is kind of driving up a wall or they're watching TV very loudly and you can kind of feel your, your blood pressure rising. You can feel yourself getting a little bit upset. It's okay to step away for a moment, take some breaths, maybe practice some mindfulness or meditation, go to the other room and step back in when you're ready. Um, so all of that to say, you know, I would imagine that most of the people watching probably have a lot of different little cups that they're trying to fill. So working, taking care of your children, taking care of your care receiver, all the other daily things that we have to take care of. Uh, but it's also very important to make sure that we've taken care of our own needs because we cannot pour from an empty cup. We can't meet the needs of all of those other things without first meeting our own needs and taking care of ourselves. Uh, so here is my contact information. If anyone has any questions, please ask them now or at the panel at the end, but you're also welcome to send me an email or give me a call and I'm happy to help you kind of work through if there's a certain behavior that you want to try different things with. I'm happy to work through that with you, but Thank you all again for your time.